Town Meeting presents Foreign Policy Forum, a discussion of some of the important issues facing the United States and affecting America's relationship with the other nations of the world. This is Jerry Lane speaking for the Town Meeting and welcoming you to our program. One of the people well qualified to speak on foreign policy is Dr. Charles Malik, former president of the United Nations General Assembly. Dr. Malik appeared at Augsburg College and was interviewed by Gene Jayberg of the town meeting staff, along with Augsburg College president, Dr. Oscar Anderson. Dr. Malik, let me press you on this matter of economic and political responsibility which is the topic, uh, one of the topics you've discussed at Augsburg. You would say that the Western nations, particularly the United States, does have responsibility toward the rest of the world and the development of the nations? Yeah, I would say that. And the United States has been expressing this responsibility for the last two decades. In the foreign aid program it has had, it has spent so far something of the order of a hundred billion dollars if you take into account uh, the Marshall Plan and uh, the Truman Doctrine and all kinds of things that the United States has been doing for the last oh, 20 years. Mm. So the United States has been very conscious of its responsibilities and it has responded to them wonderfully. Let me uh, ask about the matter of political <coughs> responsibility. It seems to me that we may more readily understand uh, our need as an affluent nation to feed and clothe and to develop the economic uh, potentials of these countries. But how about the political uh, matter? What is our responsibility here? Where does, does, uh, our, uh, where does this kind of, of concern for stability of government become a matter of political imperialism? if you are interested in other people, you would be interested in more than just feeding them and keeping them alive. Mm. I take you'll be interested in their systems of government, in the kind of outlook they have on life, and uh, in how friendly they are with each other and towards you. So you cannot be indifferent to how people live and how they organize themselves and what kind of government they have. Also, uh, it's obvious you do not want to throw away your money. You must make sure that the money is best spent for the purposes it was intended. Mm. Now, for all these reasons, it is imperative on you to take direct interest in the political systems as they arise and develop in these countries. And so I say you have political responsibilities towards these countries. At Augsburg, you've been talking about uh, a, a kind of gentle diplomacy and urging this uh, upon the Western nations and upon the United States in particular. In these days, uh, some of our diplomacy is not so gentle. How would you react to uh, the more uh, aggressive kind of American policies in certain sections of the world? It, it is impossible to make blanket statements about these things. Sometimes gentleness is the thing indicated. Sometimes we've got to be more firm, more resolute. Mm. So it, it, these things have got to be taken up, uh, each case on its own merits. I am not squeamish about how people express themselves. Sometimes they have to be harsh in putting a point across. But uh, when I speak of gentle diplomacy, I mean that there are all kinds of subtle ways when people are really diplomatically and politically mature they can have intercourse with each other in all kinds of subtle ways which would bear fruit much better than if they allowed the harsher ways to have sway in their relations with each other. So it is a measure of maturity, of depth, of interest, and of experience in the great uh, field of diplomacy. Let me press the same issue in perhaps other terms. You've talked uh, at Augsburg College about um, uh, our desire as Americans uh, to, uh, to see countries develop in evolutionary rather than re in revolutionary fashion. Is it possible that we are not allowing uh, for countries to find the, the way they want, perhaps the way they need uh, to develop as nations? I don't think you are preventing them from having their own revolutions. Mm. 
I think uh, uh, temperamentally you would feel happier because of your own experience in the past that things uh, did not uh, take place through violence but through peaceful, gradual uh, development. But uh, there will be all kinds of revolutions and uh, upheavals and changes of government and uh, uh, coups and uh, all kinds of things in the future. And I think the United States is not going to, to, to uh, interfere in how people want to bring about their own changes. So, here again, there is room where it is possible for slow, gradual, evolutionary growth and where people want to experience a revolution, why? All right, let them have it. Dr. Malik, you're asking for Western and American involvement and responsibility. Responsibility, of course, always involves risk. Uh, do you think that other people see us essentially as, as responsible? Or are they resenting American involvement? Surely in some sections of the world this is the case. Are they interpreting it as, as uh, American meddling or kind of imperialism? Well, you will find, if you are thinking of Vietnam and other issues like it, that, uh, that the world is not all one opinion on the matter. Those who are friendly towards the United States, who feel positively towards it and its values, uh, have their own view, their own interpretation of what's happening. On the other hand, those who uh, have a certain amount of jealousy and envy and ill will and sometimes fear of the United States would interpret what's happening, say, in South Vietnam in a completely different manner. So it all depends on whether originally the people with whom you talk are friendly to America or not. And by friendly, I don't mean uh, people who are not going to, de to declare war in America, people who would want to be left alone vis-a-vis -vis America. I mean people who appreciate American civilization, American values, American democracy, who, who are grateful to America for all kinds of things that it, it had uh, done to them. Well, such people do not misunderstand your policies in, in, in the world. Dr. Malik, you made the point that there uh, is... Um something that needs to be asked on our part after we have made these efforts to help people in a material and an economic way. In other words, uh, we've got to uh, make clear something with respect to our motives and who we think we are and uh, how we view the other person. Yes. Uh, the friends of America, if I may put it this way, the people who are friendly in the manner I described, are people who are bothered not so much by American policies abroad as by lack of adequate self-knowledge on the part of America of its own perennial values. And sometimes they are disturbed because they find this wave of cynicism, relativism, materialism sweeping the country and expressing itself in these youth movements and in all kinds of unfortunate uh, literary and philosophical and other forms of expression. What people are disturbed about concerning America, I mean those who love America, are, is whether the Americans uh, are not forsaking their deepest positive values. And uh, if only they can receive assurance that the country as a whole is not forsaking them, that's, that's the deepest issue that's facing both this country and those who love it abroad. Dr. Malik, um, you've intimated, I think this is true, that uh, American motives and values may not always be clear in the way we represent ourselves abroad. I'm wondering if we, if you think we as Americans have faced up to this, if our own, if we have raised the question of values and motives sufficiently, particularly in regard to our policy uh, on the, in the uh, worldwide community. My friend, this is a huge country. 
there are sections of the country who have very clear ideas about your position in the world and what you should do. There are other sections who are confused. The overall picture is one of uncertainty, is one more of confusion than of clarity of direction and policy. What is needed is the voice of leadership which will be so authoritative and so clear and so deep and so sure of itself that it can speak for the whole country. Unfortunately, I'm talking not of, of, of the political aspects of American existence. I'm talking about its spiritual and social and intellectual and moral expression. Unfortunately, what bothers the world is the absence of an authoritative voice in these fields today. And until such a voice arises who can speak with real authority, expressing in himself the deepest that there has been in American history, both America will remain confused and the rest of the world will be confused about America. You, you call for a voice. Do you see this voice expressed with, somehow within a, a movement or a people? Or is this a single voice? Well, in the end, uh, it has to be a single voice in the end, expressing the tendency and uh, ideas of the whole movement. I myself find the greatest hope from the churches in America, where I believe you have the greatest uh, reservoir of uh, spirit and purity and love and goodwill. And I, if I'm to expect any, any authoritative voice emerging in this country, I would certainly expect it from the churches rather than from the universities or any other source. Dr. Arthur Larson is a well-known authority on international law and was a close advisor to former President Eisenhower. Dr. Larson appeared at Luther Theological Seminary and during a question and answer period he was asked if an international court might be able to settle the conflict in Vietnam. I don't think there's much a court could do in Vietnam now or really there's not much a court could have done at any stage of the story. Uh, this is one of those cases where the thing had gone past the point of any kind of a judicial settlement uh, long, long in the past. Uh, there is always, there, there, there is such a point as uh, in the case of the invasion of Suez, for example. I mentioned that the Suez thing could have been handled in court, just as the Anglo-Iranian oil seizure uh, of the refinery was handled in court. But once the dive bombers have started bombing the canal zone and so forth, uh, it's too late to talk about bringing the court in. And so in Vietnam, what happened in Vietnam is that there was a nationalistic revolution which for once in the world had become identified also with the communist. The only case of its kind, by the way, uh, in, in recent history, and certainly the only, only case now. These two had coincided. And by the time the United States became involved, uh, starting in a very small way in 1954, uh, this, this whole revolution was in midstream and it was very far along with a very heavily armed insurgent group with a charismatic leader in Ho Chi Minh with the, most of the countryside behind them, with all the fervor that goes with the independence movement in any country. And the United States cuts right into the middle of this story. Uh, and uh, of course, from the very moment, certainly from the moment the United States became a prime actor in this drama, there was never anything a court could have done about it. But there was a lot the United Nations could have done about it through its other arms. I, I proposed this as far back as 1962, uh, both to the President uh, Kennedy at that time. I uh, paid a visit to the White House in early 1962, uh, spent the morning in the White House and the afternoon in the State Department. I shortly after published an article called Do It Through the UN, published a little book called Do It Through the UN. I remember the horror with which I wrote down in the first pages of this book. There have been there have been eight Americans killed, I remember. This was my takeoff point on the front page. Eight Americans killed, think of that. It's time to bring in the UN. 
and uh, I've been at it ever since. It could have been done then, just as it was done in the Congo. It's essentially the same problem, an internal uprising with outside involvement. The question is what happened in 1962 when I started pushing the, <coughs> the um, use of UN facilities in, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, in my personal meeting uh, that I referred to, which was about April, about uh, almost exactly five years, uh, four years ago, no, five years ago, uh, almost to the day now, uh, the answer I got principally was not that this wasn't a good idea, particularly, but that uh, the UN wouldn't take it. They said it over and over again, and I kept saying over and over again, well, that's their problem. Let's give it to them. If they don't want it, uh, let the UN say they won't take it. Oh, but they won't take it, so why should we propose it? And, you know, we got into this sort of exchange, and that's about as far as we ever got. I kept saying, well, look, uh, we're paying these fellows up at the UN to do this dirty kind of job. Let's get our money's worth, you know, down-to-earth talk like that. Uh, no, they wouldn't take it. But why wouldn't they take it? Because they didn't like Jim. Well, I could understand that. He wasn't very popular around the UN, and nobody particularly wanted to come to his rescue, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was to put down a threat to the peace, which was already very evident. So um, months went by, and Jem was assassinated, and the whole Jem family, and all their followers were thrown out. So I came rushing back, and I said, all right, fellas, Jem is gone. Now what? Let's take it to the UN. <laughs> You haven't got your excuse. Well, we don't want to take the UN anyway. They still won't take it. And, and uh, that is about as much of an answer as I could ever get. Uh, then, of course, as time went on, as the UN got, uh, as the United States got in deeper and deeper, the size of the military involvement uh, grew and grew. And simultaneously, the troubles at the UN got more and more uh, baffling. The Article 19 expenses problem got worse and worse until we wound up in that one horrible year of complete paralysis of the General Assembly. The two things coincided. The job got much, much harder and the UN got weaker. And uh, so then pe now people say, well, we can, look, we told you so. The UN couldn't have handled that job. Uh, it's a matter of chronology. It could have handled the job as, as recently, certainly, as 1963, and 64, and possibly 65, early 65, which is when I wrote my little book with my brother called Vietnam and Beyond, with our final set of proposals on how the UN could even then be pressed into service if we wanted to do so. As of today, it's pretty hard to say. I think, uh, curiously enough, the sentiment is swinging around. Although the job, again, has become infinitely more difficult. Uh, the desperation, the, the, uh, the uh, obvious uh, running out of alternatives is becoming more noticeable. And people are eventually being driven back to the position that if, if there's going to be any peaceful settlement here at all, it's probably going to have to utilize the only strong international organization that's in sight, and that's the UN. So uh, one way or another, I, I think that uh, the UN is going to figure in the, in, the, in the final settlement of the Vietnam story in some form, supervising the overall uh, uh, carrying out of any negotiated settlement. They're going to, it'll be a very complicated affair. Negotiations will be complicated if we ever have them. Uh, there will be population movements, there will be ceasefire inspections, there will be all kinds of things, and you have to have a, you can't just have a pickup uh, team of international scouts to, to look after something like that. You have to have a big, established, world-based organization, and there's only one. So uh, that's why I think that in some form the UN is in the, going to be in the future picture of the, of the Vietnam problem. The emergence of new nations and the exploding world population growth has created the problem of world starvation. This was the theme of an address by Dr. Robert Heilbronner, professor of economics at the New School for Social Research in New York City. 
Speaking at Augsburg College, Dr. Heilbrunner had this to say. The winds of change are blowing. All over the world, traditional village structures are little by little giving way to the ways of the 20th century. The radio, that, that enormous instrument of change, penetrates to the back villages. People wake up to the fact that it's not necessary to repeat the ways of their elders, that there are other ways of life in, in, to, to which millions of people cleave, and that these new ways of life might be applicable to themselves. If there were time, the, the imperialism of the West, the cultural imperialism of the West, would sweep around the world, as in time it surely will. The trouble is, the great immediate trouble is, there isn't any time. That is the real crisis which we face. There isn't any time for two reasons. Partly because the peoples of the underdeveloped world are themselves beginning to get restive, only beginning, but that's the least. The real reason, as you all know, and here is what I tell you what you know, is of course the fearful, frightful population dilemma. Now I must recite some statistics. Everybody is aware, of course, these days of the population explosion. It's just a question of ringing different changes on well-known bells. Let me say a few, give you a few facts. The Foreign Policy Association recent, recently put out a little discussion brochure, uh, which, had, uh, which began nicely. It said, as I remember it, these statistics are too unbelievable to believe, but they're true anyway. They are, number one, every day 10,000 people someplace in the world die of malnutrition. And secondly, and this is the real shocker, of every 20 children born in the world in the underdeveloped areas, 10 die in infancy from lack of proper food, and of the other 10, seven will be physically or mentally retarded because of an absence of sufficient nutrition. The, the brute fact of the world is that the number of people pouring into it is so much greater than the amount of tonnage of food being added to it, that if the curve of mouths and the curve of foodstuffs continues at their present rates, in the 1970s, there will be, there must be, famine affecting hundreds of millions or even possibly billions of people, a famine that has been called by the Food and Agriculture Association potentially the most colossal catastrophe in history. It isn't just food, of course, that is, that is bringing this crisis upon us. To house the two billion people who will arrive on the surface of this planet between now and the year 2000, to house them, and by housing I mean putting up some corrugated tin sides for them to live inside and under. To house them will require building as many structures in the next 40 years as have been built in the whole recorded history of the human race. The population pressure not only augments sheer numbers, but it acts in unpleasant ways in pushing those numbers around. It pushes them off the countryside where they simply cannot find enough to eat into the city where they hope by some miracle that food will grow from the sidewalks. That is why Whereas populations in the world are increasing at 2, 3, and even 4% a year, which means they double in 30, 25, 20 years. In the cities, in Latin America and in Asia, populations are increasing by something like 12% a year. Calcutta, the, the, the possibly the greatest human cesspool now in existence, with some 3 to 6 million beings in it, will, at its present rate of increase by the year 2000, be a human or subhuman rabbit warren holding between 33 and 66 million people. Inconceivable. As a result of the fact that people are pouring into the planet so fast, it also becomes impossible not merely to feed them or to house them or to put them in cities, but even to give them the elements of education by which they can improve their lot. Illiteracy, despite the greatest worldwide effort at, at teaching 
A's, B's, and C's. Illiteracy has increased in the last 10 years by 200 million people. There are 200 million more people who can't read or write today than there were when we started the great anti-illiteracy campaign. I could go on with the figures, but I think you get the picture. The question is, what to do? What, what all this holds out by way of economic and political likelihoods? On the one hand, the overwhelming need to modernize the fact that backward political, economic, social, sociological structures must give way to modern ones if change and then development is to take place. On the other hand, this relentless pressure of mouths that takes away the one chance for letting change seep in, that is, that makes the crisis near at hand rather than something we can postpone. Well. One thing to do, or to try to do, one thing that will be done, and that must be done, is to try and raise the output of food. The underdeveloped nations where starvation takes place are the world's least productive areas. In India, for example, gets about 900 pounds of rice out of an acre. China gets 1,600. Egypt gets 3,000. America gets much, much more. Uh, again, to take India, which is, of course, the great crying example, only about half of all the food that India raises gets to market. Now, a great deal of, the, of that other half, of course, gets eaten right by the people who grow it. But of the portion that they withhold, an enormous percentage, 25 or 35 percent, simply gets eaten up by the rats and the bugs. Uh, it's stored in old crockery jars. You see these when you look at pictures in life of Indian village. Now take a look in the back of the house, or inside the house, at the place where they keep the rice or the wheat, millet, whatever they raise. And it's usually a cracked old jug. And uh, the, 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 the India feeds its mice liberally. It's possible to remedy some of these practices. Not so easy as one would think. It means penetrating into backward villages where peasants traditionally, and for damned good reasons, associate visitors with taxation. Uh, and uh, they don't like people coming from the cities telling them how to keep their grain. But something could be done. Something can be done to make more food grow in these acres, fertilizer. India uses something like 400,000 tons of fertilizer. If India is to double its crop in about 25 years, which is what she seeks to do, she will have to use at least six times as much. And if she uses as much fertilizer as she ought to use, that is to say Western standards, she will use all the fertilizer which is produced in all the world. So that with difficulty, and I'll talk about the difficulties again, something can surely be done to make more food available. I haven't even mentioned, of course, what we can do. Uh, the situation is changing in this country from one of shortage to one of surplus. I beg your pardon, one of surplus to one of shortage. For years, we've been overproducing on the farms and piling it up in the granaries. Then, recently, uh, as the realities of impending famine have come across to us, we've begun to ship these surpluses abroad. Until now, the cupboard is bare. And so the discussions continue on the pressing problems facing mankind. And this is the purpose of town meeting, for town meeting is people, people talking about the issues of the day and seeking to find understanding and solutions through communication. This is Jerry Lane speaking for the town meeting and thanking you for being with us.